Okay, well, thanks very much. So I'm going to change direction completely, but I, I think what I want to talk about is how we actually come at things from a different direction because we all want to get to the, the same end game, which is actually better patient care, better patient outcomes. Um, so I'm going to look at things primarily from a metabolomics perspective. So if we look at, uh, we're really talking about a, a paradigm change. It's not necessarily doing things differently, but actually trying to do things more holistically. So really what I'm going to, I want to talk about is top down, but also bottom up. Okay? And uh, for those people that have been keeping up with what's happening in uh, Leroy Hood's lab, He's very much advocating now the P4 medicine, which is very much top down, but it's all based around getting really good quality genetic data and then moving down to get really good quality proteomic data. And they've done some fantastic work over the last few years. And he spoke about four years ago about doing the same thing in the metabolomic space. But I haven't seen any evidence in publications, etc. but I expect that suddenly that's going to hit us. And so it's really important that we actually consider all of the omics and we somehow try and tie them together. And I have to be honest, in my opinion, I only know of about half a dozen people around the country that have got a good enough handle that they really understand all of the different omics okay, and how to work across them. So we, we really need to identify people like that and work closely with them if we're going to make really advanced, good advances. And I put up here, um, looking through the, the telescope, so I'm using the analogy of um, genomics down here through to the phenotype up the top. And if we look at the next slide, you'll actually see that realistically, looking from here, we're, we're trying to look at gen the genome to actually get through to the phenotype. But on the other extreme, we've got metabolomics where we can actually get closer to the phenotype. Okay. And when I talk about stuff, it's not that anything's better than others, it's actually complementary. And if we don't take advantage of that complementary nature, we're ultimately shortchanging everything we do. So I'm sure you've all seen this diagram uh, ad infinitum, but I think it's actually fairly important into this, in this context. In the, we've got this very, very complex feedback loop. And even if I start up at genomics, you know, we still see public publications and in fact uh, George Church's lab is still doing a lot of work trying to understand those regions of the genome that we can't uh, make sense of. Right? And there's a lot of work going into that. Um, but then coming down to metabolomics, in theory it's a relatively new uh, area. Although we often ascribe the original metabolomic experiment to Linus Pauling back in 1971 where he did GCMS analysis of um, uh, amino acids in Europe. Uh, and for a while, it looked like uh, metabolomics was really not going to stand alone as a, as a separate entity, one of the omics. Because a lot of the equipment we use is very similar to that that we actually use in proteomics. And because of that, the proteomic community said, let's just encompass everything. And, and I think in terms of where we've come, that would have been a disaster. right? Because even though we do use the same equipment, the types of experiments we do are very different and the interpretation is different as well. And, and uh, so, I mean, I, I, I know Simon's had the same frustrations in terms of building uh, a capability in instrumentation in, in the genomics area. You have the same thing in the mass spec area, which is the, the core that we use for both proteomics and metabolomics, in that you talk to, the, to a funding body and they think, oh, it's just another mass spec. How is that aspect different from that one? And that's something where we've failed pretty badly in terms of educating the, the funding bodies so that they actually understand that, that we do need lots of different aspects that people collaborate with across, the, 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 across Australia but across the globe that can do different things, just like the different genome sequence systems will pull out different information, which is very, very complementary. And it's one thing that people often don't get at the metabolomics level. And uh, there was a really nice paper published at one stage where it's, is metabolomics the Cinderella of the ball, where it looked like metabolomics wasn't going to get up as a, 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 an opix in its own right. But luckily we've moved past that. So 
you've got to have a definition. Okay? And there are a couple of different uh, definitions that are used, but the simplest one is that effectively we're trying to identify every small molecule in a system and how each of the, the levels or concentrations of those small molecules change associated with disease in response to I mean, even exercise, etc. But really we're trying to measure everything. And ultimately you should be saying, but that's not possible. And the bottom line is it's not possible. And it means that we've actually got to use a lot of different techniques. Um, and like I said, just another mass spec doesn't cut the mustard. But uh, you'll see a little bit later that we do need to use complementary tools. And in fact, uh, I'm, uh, as much as the instrumentation is my passion, I actually made a decision not to talk about any of that today. Matthew will be pleased to hear that. Because it's really, it is very important, but uh, let's talk about how it fits in the context of what today is about. And, and often if you read through literature, you'll see going back to about 2000, there are papers that refer to metabonomics. And that's really driven by Jeremy Nicholson's group, who are now at Imperial College. And, and it was because most of the work they did was actually uh, human health based. Okay, whereas a lot of other people that are doing exactly the same thing, where it, was, it came out of the plant community, metabolomics is much more prevalent. And so depending on the alliance that various groups had with either Jeremy Nicholson's group or going back to the Max Planck group or the Metabolomics Society, you'll see that one of those or two of those terms will get used. And certainly for a while, there used to be that metabolomics was talking about plants, okay, and environmental uh, approaches, and metabolomics was talking about humans, whereas really that's completely blurred these days. Um, but the other thing that's really important is actually now the metabolic phenotype. Okay? And again, it's really trying to get a handle on exactly what's happening now in your system. And it's really very much focused on biofluids and it's trying to use your composition of all the molecules we can measure at that point in time as a reflection of your health status. And you know, to put it into the context, the genotype is very much the blueprint, right? The phenotype is the, blue, is the blueprint actually in action. So it's actually what's happening right now, right? So again, it's looking from different ends, but you need to look at both to actually get the total picture. And, and I put this one up and <coughs> I have to say, this is in no way saying that any of the omics are any more difficult than the other. Um, I have to say, I did give a talk last year and my wife went to a meeting about a month later and some geneticist came up and said, your husband was trashing genomics. <laughs> Whereas all I wanted to explain was the fact that they're different. I would never advocate that I could actually do anything sensible in the genomic space. I just don't have the skills. Right? We've got four bases that we have. An annotation of genomes is just really complex, right? We go to proteomics, we're suddenly looking at the amino acid sequences. We've got 20 plus amino acids. And again, we've gone from uh, just the four bases to 20 plus, but then the complication is all the post-translational modifications. You know, it's a really complicated area. And then we go to metabolomics, and again, it's, it's different again. We're looking at small molecules, and we're talking about hundreds of classes of compounds, each of those classes having a whole range of molecules within them. So the tools we need are different, okay? But there's a, a much greater blur between proteomics and metabolomics because of the fact that it tends to be very much mass spectrometry based. But we still need that feedback loop where we're actually trying to see things as a system. And it's one of the things that uh, Leroy Hood is very much pushing is the fact that we should be starting with a, as a basis systems medicine. Okay? That that really is, is the, the baseline that you actually do everything from. But you've got to have healthy people that you've actually built up their systems picture before you can actually go down the path that he's advocating. The other things that are important here is that the phenotype is closer to the physiological influence. And, and that, as you'll see later, that really plays a 
important role, and also it's closer to the environmental influence. So effectively, the phenotype is the gene leading the environment. You know, that's a, a, a good, it's a little bit simplistic, but effectively the outcome is the phenotype. It's the influence of environment on the cards you've been dealt at birth, largely, and, and how they come together. And uh, I just want to put up the instruments. So the sort of instrumentation we tend to use is nuclear magnetic resonance, spectroscopy, HPLC, MS, and GCMS. And there's a whole workflow section we go through, but it's not really um, necessary for the discussion we're going to have. But, and typically, I'm advocating that we should be doing things in an untargeted way. Um, and you'll see why a little bit later. Now, this is a common thing. Everyone thinks metabolomics is expensive. And if I look at it, if someone says to me, I want you to do a GCMS analysis metabolomics experiment, I've got 20 biological replicates. replicates. Typically, we'd say, okay, it's GCMS. We're talking around about $40 per sample, okay? And you've got your control as well as the other, okay? But under that circumstances, I might see, if I, let's say I'm doing plasma, I'd see about 300 compounds in each sample, okay? And that works out to be a pretty good bang for your buck. But the bottom line is that the metabolome is so much bigger than that. If I actually then go ahead and use a LCMS where my mass spectrometer is a protocol time of flight so I can get pseudo-accurate mass, I can get really good precision, suddenly I'm talking about, and, and you read papers, if you read anything and they talk about features, they're just trying to blow up the numbers. Like, for instance, if I actually measure a particular molecule and it's there as a plus H, it's there as a, with sodium, it's there with potassium, it's there with some solvent out, that's the same compound. Okay, it's just part of the ionisation process. We're seeing these multiple features, as we call them. It should always come back to the number of compounds. And the good thing, if we go with UPLC MS, with a coropole time of flight, typically we should see somewhere between 1,000 and 2,000 compounds. Right, so our ability to see things is greatly improved, but we still need to get to do better than that. I mean, there are groups that report, you know, four or five thousand compounds, but there you're talking about a two million dollar piece of kit. So it's certainly not high throughput. It's certainly not something that we can look at putting into the clinical environment. Whereas the quadrupole time of flight mass spectrometer, and, and I should say we're in the quadrupole time of flight era. It, it owns the mass spec space at the moment. And it is such a powerful technique. So if you look at it from that perspective, let's say you have a paternity testing. It's uh, the, the group in Australia that does it, $262 a pop for one father and one child. Okay, it's roughly about 10 alleles from memory. So you're looking at about 26 bucks per allele. Okay. I can run a blood sample and with UPLCMS, let's say I run it in a whole range of different modes. It may, may cost $500. Right, to do something that's really comprehensive. And I'm seeing a thousand plus compounds, so I'm talking about 50 cents a compound. So if we put it into that context, it's not all that expensive. Sorry, it's no more expensive. All of the omics are expensive in essence, and it's why we've got to work out ways that we can get better information out of all of this. And um, it was actually good to hear the, the lipid biopsy because we're actually, again, looking from the bottom up. Uh, same sort of thing, if you've got a transplant patient, the last thing you'd want to do is have a biopsy if you don't need to. But if we can actually look at the blood uh, and from that infer the health of the organ, then effectively it's treating metabolomics like the liquid biopsy, but it's looking at small molecules rather than DNA fragments laying around in the plasma. Um, and, and it's the sort of thing where we can look at uh, for CSF, the brain, hopefully we wouldn't have to do that so much, and hopefully with some of the recent advances in metabolomics, in blood where they've actually, from blood, can infer if someone's actually going to get Alzheimer's at some stage. There's some, been some nice advances in there. There's um, a couple of things done recently on breast cancer and colorectal cancer using blood uh, from a metabolomics perspective. The, the challenge, though, is we can go through and make these measurements is actually understanding it because our, our knowledge of that biology is still uh, limited. So, how do we move forward? Okay. So, um, Jeremy Nicholson's group, 
got the equipment from the London Olympics. So all of the mass spec gear went to Imperial College. Okay? And what they did, they also got funding from Medical Research Council and the National Institute of Health. It will come up later in the later slide. And they got um, around about 20 million Australian dollars and they set up a system whereby they could actually do metabolomics on the industrial scale. Okay? And their focus of, of all the grant was very much patient journey. How could you improve the stay for someone in hospital? And they tended to focus on patients in intensive care. And that was the whole premise behind what they were doing. So they've actually set up a lab at Hammersmith Hospital. And it's got about uh, I think 15 mass specs. And each of the mass specs run one type of analysis, nothing else. Because anyone that's run done anything with mass spec, you know the thing that causes your downtime is when you change from one assay to another. If they're just doing one thing and you've got good protocols, typically you can have about a 95% uptime as opposed to anything as bad as 50% when you're swapping over too much. So those things are actually important. And just so this is just finishing off. This was the funding they got for the uh, uh, setting up the system. They have the capacity to run 100,000 samples a year, so they're really getting to be able to do some population studies. And in fact, there's two parts to it. One is associated with the um, ICU unit, and the other is associated with doing population studies. So getting groups that have been funded by the MRC, etc., and measuring everything they can associated with those particular samples. And it's not, you know, so we can also start to look at wellness studies as well, but clearly that's further down the track. It's the sort of approach that uh, the Roy Hood is taking, but we can start to look at doing that from the bottom up. And certainly in China, there is an enormous push to actually develop protocols in the metabolomic space for looking at wellness. And the other thing that we can actually get is the, to start to develop patient stratification. So you can actually start to separate your patients in, in terms of how a clinician will actually deal with it. And they, they already have online all of these tests. So they routinely run everything by nuclear magnetic resonance as well. And they run urine, plasma and serum. They've got a, a library of 600 compounds, but routinely they're doing around about 300 metabolites that they'll look at. Um, when we go to LCMS, Okay, this is where if we're going to get the best out of the data, we have to invest a little bit up front. So we need to have a, an LCMS that does reverse phase chromatography, that does, just looks at positive ions. Another one will set up exactly the same, but just looks at negative ions. And then we'll have another one that actually has, <coughs> sorry, I'm moving around too much, a polar column, right, for looking at all of those polar compounds that you don't get to see with a CAT column. And again, we'll need to run, have one instrument that runs positive ion, run in one instrument that runs negative ion. And traditionally, uh, anyone that's worked in a clinical lab will know that a lot of the analysis, we tend to be very targeted and use triple quads because they can actually give us great precision, really good sensitivity. The QTOF technology has moved on to the stage now that some of the very latest generation instruments are approaching sensitivities of the triple quads. Okay, the traditional toxicology type instrument. But the, the big advantage of a QTOF is the fact that it can actually scan across the mass range really fast. Typically they'll do somewhere from uh, 30 to 80 scans per second. Right? But they can also do simultaneous MSMS. So we actually not only get accurate mass associated with our instrument, we then start to get some structural information. And that's done very, very quickly. Right? And that is really powerful in terms of the, the, where we just do straight MS, that helps us identify the compounds and that's the sort of thing that we go through and see what new compounds we might find associated with the disease. The MSMS is where we can go through and look at all of the compounds we know associated with the disease and we can plug them in and get the information. We can do quantitation. So effectively we can almost do quantitation and qualitative work in the same month. Not quite there, but we're getting pretty close. So, for instance, we can screen for amino acids without having to have a separate amino acid method. You know, so, 
what it means is we get this very, very wide coverage and if we had a bank of these instruments set up, we could get a sample, for instance, say from the intensive care ward. We could extract it in about an hour and a half, two hours, an hour to run along the instrument. All of the, a lot of the interpretations are around a whole series of diseases is already set up. So the next day, we could actually be providing the clinician who's looking after the, the patient on the ward with a, a really massive screen and interpretation of that data uh, in the context of diseases we know about. So it's a massive step forward that we can actually get. And the the and you should be asking me the question I'm surprised no one has is this sounds like a horrendously expensive approach. And so we get a full metabolite profile for each mode of operation. So we're not just looking at one or two biomarkers that traditionally we use with uh, clinical chemistry tests. We get identification of comorbidities by looking for everything. We interpret the data and the whole thing is this is based on 10 plus years of research trying to refine this that the guys at Imperial have done. And the rationale behind the funding, the average patient stay in ICUs around about 10 days. If you could cut that to nine days by actually better diagnosing comorbidities and other conditions, and the fact that the average cost per day for an ICU bed is ten thousand dollars, so if you could actually cut ten days to nine, right, you would actually get another four patients through each ICU bed a year. Doesn't sound very much, but put it into context. Um, Right. If we set the ward up adjacent to the ICU ward, so we actually can do it all, and we've got our 36 hour top turnaround. And I'll just jump to the next one. Uh, how many beds, ICU beds are there in Perth? In metropolitan Perth? There's more than 120. So if we could actually service, or a group could service those 120 beds, effectively another 480 patients would go through ICU a year. There would be some cost, okay, sure, but um, the savings would far outweigh, well, it's not a saving because you're not going to take money back because you're still going to keep that bed there, but effectively the benefit to society would be improved substantially. And if I show you a couple of, uh, so, if we were able to get something like this in WA or in Australia, it starts to make a, a very significant impact because it's going to generate a ton of research. Because not only are you delivering something that the clinicians can use straight away, because all the data is untargeted, it means that people can go back and keep mining it forever. So it's actually it's like doing a rain or a Bustleton study and being, you know, being able to go back and collect and mine that data for a very long time to come. And so in Metropolitan Perth, there are five public hospitals, we've got 100, more than 120, and that doesn't include the kids' hospital or the maternal, maternity hospital. And if we put it into that sort of context, right, financially, a 10K per patient or 365K per bed is being saved, right, four additional patient journeys, put it into context. This, over 10 years, we put another 5,000 patients through intensive care. Okay. Or, potentially, you'd be saving the equivalent of nearly 400 million over 10 years. So, given that we're not going to actually save that money because it has to be invested to support that bed, if you could actually get something like this to work, you would service the community uh, and the patient care outcomes would be fantastic. I have to say this is not absolutely proven yet, but it certainly is something that the, the group at Imperial are trying to, to prove. And uh, in addition, they actually have calls for their centre to actually run uh, large studies as well. So all data, because it's simultaneous, we can actually go through a mine, and then if we can actually use it in the context of uh, patient data, right, you can actually start to develop new biomarkers but also exclude biomarkers that are clearly um, either we don't understand 
or they're not sensible. And you know, it's enormous infrastructure that would come that would really support a whole lot of research in HMRC. And if we look at, so this from that perspective, so metabolomics for this metabolic phenotyping has the ability to provide a whole lot of different types of solutions that could actually be used and would translate it possibly be. So I put this up to, to get people to think metabolomics is just part of the picture. Right? And that's the key thing, is that if we don't use all of the parts of the picture, we're really not doing the best we can for patients. And if we start to look at delivery of um, biomarkers, okay, and that certainly has been the driver. A lot of my colleagues say, we've got to find these biomarkers. Well, I think that metabolomics' real job is actually helping understand disease. It's defining pathways and pathway changes. It's not actually finding these magic bullets. It, it hopefully will, but that won't, that shouldn't be our, our upfront driver. And if we look at uh, metabolites, how do we, if we integrate it with physiological data and the other, other owners, we should be looking at this sort of thing. We do measurements, we do our compound annotation and our identification, we map them on the pathways, and then the first question we've got is, have we been able to map everything? And is, in fact, is it consistent? Right? Are there compounds that we can't find a pathway to put on or that we haven't been able to identify? Clearly they'll actually get culled. Then we look at pathway regulation and, and tie that into is the data we've generated or the annotation and interpretation done, is it consistent with physiological data? And again, if it's not, we don't understand it. So it gets put in the too hard basket and it gets culled as a potential biomarker. And then we've got to show that we're, we're consistent with proteomics data. And again, that's another culling step. And again, as well, we've got to have consistency with RNA and, and uh, DNA data. That's how we should develop biomarkers if we're actually starting from the metabolomics side. Not, oh, I've got all these numbers. I've, I've got 30 compounds that are, that are up and down regulated. Well, until that, we can tie it back to the omics data and the physiology data and, and the, the clinical data, we haven't got anything. And I'll just finish off uh, one last thing. One of the projects we've been working on for a while now with John Olney is actually measuring hepcidin, which is a, it's the, the, the peptide that combines ferroportin in the gut. So if you've got hemochromatosis, you don't produce enough. So you absorb too much iron. Uh, with some forms of chronic anemia, you can actually have problems with uh, having too much, so you suppress iron absorption too much. Um, it's a pretty sticky little molecule. Um, Molecular weight's about 20, 2790. There are eight cysteine residues, which means we've got four intermolecular or intramolecular disulfide bonds, so it means chromatographically it's a bit of a challenge. Well, the good thing, though, is the, the column technology improved so much over the last 10 years that it's almost the goal to, to actually analyse it now compared to what it was 10 years ago. Um, so this is a, a schematic of the compound. It was discovered back in 2001. And we actually had a quantitative moldy toff method uh, which we published back in 2010. Um, and these peaks here, this is hepcidin 25, which is compound, which is the one that does all of the regulation in the gut. And you can see that all of these are one mass unit apart, so we've got really good resolution at the isotopic level. Okay, so they're singly charged species. And you can see we actually had to do standard addition, but it's really nice and linear. And putting it into context at the time, our limit of detection was, uh, where are we? Ours. But these are all the other issues. This was ours, but uh, we were actually at 80.5 picomoles per millimolar creatinine. And our precision intraday was 9.4%, intraday was 9 to 9.5, and we only needed 0.8 mils of microliters of urine, so it was actually very good. And I'll put this next slide up because this is the current status of the round robin for hepcidin that was done in 2012. Across the bottom are all the different labs, okay? And this shows the values they got there. There was at least an order of magnitude difference between different labs, and they couldn't resolve what the problem was. And so the solution was to build a mathematical model that different labs could use 
so they could then try and compare the data. As a someone who actually runs instruments, and I, I don't see that as a solution, but um, that's where it was at the time. And the group, one of the leading groups in the world, the following year published a paper where they actually found another um, form of hepcidin, right? They actually found hepcidin 24, right? So 24 amino acids, and it was hepcidin 24 they were using to as an internal standard. So it sort of brought a whole lot of measurements in that uh, in, in question. Um, and so the work we've been doing, we've followed up, and, and Joel from our group's actually been looking at a new method. So this is. Uh, hepcidin, it's actually a uh, plus three state, and this is heavy hepcidin, which we use as an internal standard. It's eight mass units higher, so there's no problems about physiological in interference. And this is a plus three, plus four, and plus five charge state, so we can actually see multiple charge states for confidence of identification of compound. And we've also got it running on uh, our ABCI 5600 QTOP as well, and here we can see someone who's got hemochromatosis versus a healthy person. You can see the very clear differentiation between a full of disease and, and healthy. And we've got it running under multiple methods as well. And this is one done on a, a triple quad, so the, the cheapest end of the range, but we can see very clear differentiation between someone that's got hemochromatosis and, and a healthy person. So, you know, this is all done uh, actually on the, the very high resolution instrument is done in a completely untargeted way. So there's a whole quantum of data sitting there waiting for us to actually interpret it. So it's really quite exciting from that perspective. Thanks for your attention. Okay, and uh, just wanted to acknowledge all of the groups that supported us. And um, I'll finish there. I'm just waiting for a picture of my group. It seems to be stuck. Well, thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.